All right, welcome to our fourth um, video in Unit 6. This one's called Cell Potentials in Standard Conditions. It's kind of a foundation for the rest of this unit. So, well, here we go. So electrons will flow spontaneously in a voltaic cell from the anode to the cathode. Again, I'm going to actually highlight that because you're going to be asked that all the time. That is going from the anode to the cathode. But that is due to their differences in potential energy. Um, that's just kind of how electrons work. If you look at the charges, it makes sense. So the larger the difference, the more they will flow, meaning the larger their difference in potential energy between those electrodes, the more the electrons will flow. And they will generally flow towards that with the higher potential energy, which is why they go anode to cathode. However, um, you're not always told what's the anode cathode. Sometimes you're told, hey, these are the two things we're reacting together, and you get to figure out which one's going to be the anode and which one's going to be the cathode. So again, they go towards the one with the higher potential energy. So the difference in potential energy between the electrodes is called the cell potential. And commonly we denote that by E sub cell, E referring to potential, you know, of course, we start potential with an E, and cell referring to the cell potential. But this is commonly measured in volts. So whenever you hear the voltage of something, that's referring to its cell potential, or the potential energy of that cell. Now, sometimes the cell potential is also called the electromotive force, or EMF. Um, and by sometimes, I mean commonly, because it's the force that provides the motor, if you will, of this electricity. So EMF and voltage and cell potential are all basically the same term. Now, let me tell you what a volt is. One volt is the potential difference required to impart one joule of energy to a charge of one coulomb. Now, we'll talk about coulomb in a bit, but one volt is one joule per coulomb. Please remember that somewhere. I've actually seen questions on the AP test that says, what is a volt? And you're like, are you kidding me? But you get a free point because you know that a volt is a joule per coulomb. So get that down. Now, a coulomb, though, is actually a measure of charge. For example, one electron has a charge of 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulomb. That's how we say that electrons have negative charges. It's We're measuring their charge. The negative is more relative to protons and stuff. But since our cell potential is measured in volts, we, as I mentioned before, also commonly call it the voltage of our cell. So again, cell potential... It's the same thing as the uh, electromotor force, which is also called the voltage. All right. So, the cell potential for voltaic cells is determined by determining the difference in cell potentials of the two half cells. Well, that should make sense. The overall cell is just the, the overall potential is the difference between the anode and cathode. So... So the standard reduction potentials that are used, I'm sorry, the standard potentials, are called the standard reduction potentials. And they're denoted by E, standard red, for reduction. They represent the likelihood that this cell will accept electrons. Basically, the likelihood that it will undergo reduction. So the higher the number, the more likely they are to reduce. And the lower the number, the more likely they are to oxidize. So... Given two half cells, then, the one with the more positive potential will tend to be the cathode. Remember, red cat and an ox. Okay? The more likely it is to be reduced, that means the more likely it is to be a cathode. And the one with the lower potential will be, and sorry, I'll get there in a bit, will tend to be the anode because it's more likely to oxidize. Now, let me show you a phrasing difference. I accidentally use the phrase lower, okay? And typically, sometimes we refer to the word smaller. Now, technically, 1 and 0 0.1, point 0.1 is the smaller number. My hope is you completely agree with me. However, technically, 
negative 0.1 is also the smaller number. So smaller refers to basically the absolute value. The phrasing I use, however, is the more positive one, meaning in this case, the more positive is negative 0.1. In this case, the more positive is positive 1. So keep in mind that you need the one that is the most positive, not just has the smallest number. So there you go. All right. So the standard cell potential, then, is basically our difference between our cathode and our anode. So cathode minus anode. This is not always positive. Keep that in mind. Most of the time, though, it will be. However, sometimes they'll say, hey, if this reaction was our anode and this is our cathode, it, you know, what's the cell potential? And sometimes it'll get negative. Um, anyways, though, it's just your cathode minus your anode. There you go. All right. By the way, changing the stoichiometry coefficients of our half reactions do not change their potential, and neither does reversing it. It's just the same thing. It doesn't matter if you double or triple. Now, this is kind of a reminder to myself that I, more so to you guys, you should get a chart of the standard reduction potentials. And if I haven't passed them out yet, um, well, pass them out. And if you're watching this and you're not in my class, just go online, Google standard reduction potential charts. That'll give you basically a list of all the stuff you need to find. So here's the thing, though. This is where it starts getting crazy. If our E, referring to our cell potential, is greater than zero, that process is thermodynamically favored. Yes, that's right. I just related this to last unit. If our cell potential is positive, our reaction is spontaneous. If it's not, well, then it's not spontaneous or not thermodynamically favored. Okay? This stuff gets gnarly because we start relating this to, like, everything, especially next video. But as a start, if our cell potential is positive, it's spontaneous. If it's not, it's not spontaneous. Just keep that in mind for now. Finally, if two half cells do not produce a positive cell potential, they cannot be used to make a voltaic cell. Well, think about it. Voltaic cells are when you set things up, and it kind of goes on its own. It's meant to generate electricity. However, if something's not spontaneous, that means you have to give it energy to make it work, which means it doesn't produce its own. So it has to be spontaneous to make a voltaic cell, which means our cell potential has to be positive. Just kind of keep that in mind again, relating things. There you go. So, <clears throat> here's a reaction. Considering that the standard reduction potential of zinc to zinc solid is negative 0.6, calculate basically the SRP for copper 2 plus and copper. That's your overall cell potential. Good luck. Spend a few minutes. Come back. All right. So, in this case, we're using this equation. And the first thing we need to do is figure out whether, what's our cathode and what's our anode. Well, zinc's going from an oxidation number of 0 to 2. Copper's going from 2 to 0. That means that our cathode will be um, copper, because red cat, it's reducing. And anode will be zinc. So that says that 1.10 is equal to our... E of our copper, if you will, minus negative 0 0.76. Well, I'm pretty sure you can do that math. Your cell potential of copper is positive, sorry, positive 0 0.34 volts. There you go. Just that ends up being, you know, positive 1.1 minus that, etc. There you go. That's your introduction to cell potentials. Um, in this case, by the way, that that cell itself is positive, but we more so care that this whole cell is positive, which means spontaneous. We can make a voltaic cell, yay, etc. Next video, stuff starts getting crazy. But for now, thanks for watching.